When people have something horrible happen to them, eventually it is a spiritual struggle. Many people have no qualms whatsoever to come to see me at any time. That's what I'm here for. We as, as religious people were wondering, you know, how in the world um, can we uh, cooperate with all of these other entities, you know, uh, and, you know, where do we fit? Everyone is a service provider, be it clergy, be it um, domestic, someone working in the field of domestic violence. The value of linking the faith community with the victim assistance community is that uh, all are needed to serve the individual. We both speak the language of compassion. Fragmentation does not work with victimization and healing. Unity works, holistic works, and coming together to help the person come together works. In 1982, the uh, President's Task Force came out with its uh, report on crime victims. Studies have shown that clergy were one of the first places that victims started to go to in the natural course of seeking counseling uh, or moral support. And clergy were almost forced to begin to, uh, to learn more about crime victim issues. I got involved as a police chaplain with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department, the Santa Fe Police Department, um, because of the trauma that these officers were going through. This was that shooting that happened out there off of Rufina Street, and, you know, I, I was the second officer there. I was back up to David, and I, I just was kind of overwhelmed with the whole thing. Uh, Ministers began there, being asked by police departments to assist in counseling of police officers. I saw a lot of law enforcement officers that were in pain, that didn't know how to process. I was right there to help them. Uh, of course, when events happen in different communities, such as the Oklahoma City bombing, clergy are often pulled into that uh, to assist in the response. So I made my way back down to the temporary morgue and uh, when I walked in, our officers, our detectives who were working that scene were, you could tell, were traumatized. How do you deal with the human spirit that's been crushed by what it's seen, what it's smelled, what it's heard? Crisis and traumatic issues are things that strip us at our very core values because we just never thought it would happen to us. So a specific trained chaplain working alongside of law enforcement and helping our community is the ideal person to be that first responder. Uh, the Clergy Response Institute was established in Oklahoma City to help train clergy for any kind of community response that they may face and also to receive training on criminal victimization and violence. Well, we were talking to our chaplaincy has great partnerships within our community with community-based organizations. So who do you have going with you? Well, Frank's giving some direction. Uh, he's going to give me further direction here in a little bit. We're going to uh, contact the counselors and counselors psychologists and, uh, at the school in order to make sure that they have a heads up as to why the boys are absent. What district is this? It's going to be San Juan Unified School District. Okay. We have over 70 chaplains that respond alongside of officers to victims in homicides, suicides, fatal accidents, child deaths. If they're standing in the rain because of a fatal accident, it could be just to hold an umbrella for them. Get them a cup of coffee. Here I have a beautiful crucifix. And, um, and people see, oh, this guy's Roman Catholic. I, I would say to them at the scene, it doesn't matter what I am. What matters is that I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm not here to preach to you about my religion or impose to you on my religion. The fact is that I'm here for you. What can I do for you?
Sidron Institute is a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate all the different professionals and individuals who work with victims and their their expertise is on trauma. The challenge was to explore ways to bring the faith community and the secular service providers who work with victims together to form a cohesive network. We were hired to develop this project, bringing Elaine's gifts as a service provider and mine as clergy. The more traditional service providers actually will say to you, I cannot meet the spiritual needs of many of the people who come to me for help. So I know that there's parts of the healing that I cannot address. However, I'm not very comfortable in working with people of the faith community, with clergy, because they don't understand how we provide services and we don't understand them. The justice system is beautiful in this country, but it's also complicated. What I see as the greatest challenge is trust between the two professions. Probably the most important way to build relationships is one-on-one -on -one contact. Um, also, joint training sessions where you know that individuals have been exposed to the same sort of material and learning that you have. I have to be honest enough to say to myself, I've taken this person as far as I can go. Mm -hmm. Now I need to give this person to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And But I, I just, I need that person that I can trust to refer that person yeah, see, to. And I the service yeah. Today, I feel like we, they, have, they have invited us in, they pulled us in, and, uh, and looked at us as a viable option for services to people. You know, we can reach people where they can't, they can reach people where we can't. The church provides something tangible, although you can't put your hands on it, it's tangible, and it manifests itself in how a victim behaves and goes about following the rest of the links of the chain. The, only the person who's the service provider in the clinic only knows what the client presents them with. If I walk around the corner to go get a couple of kids for choir practice, I see them where they play, I see their house, I've chatted with the adult that they live with, so I think there's an opportunity for exchange of information and support. We always talk about collaboration. Collaboration is very important, and it's gotta be modeled between the two of us. And I can tell you, it is, that's who, when people see us, they say, wow, the two of you, you know? We have different methods sometimes, different ways of approaching people. But the one thing that we, in our heart and soul, believe in, and the reason we're doing this work, is because the core of it all is to respect the victim, to respect their needs, so we always say, remember the double R's. Right, right. <laughs> Respect and, and relationships. relationships. The Caspel Res Reservation is located um, next to the city of Usk in um, northeast Washington, about 40 miles south of the Canadian border. We experience, like any other city or population, um, a diverse array of crimes. We have a high population of the individuals that we work with that are experiencing domestic violence, sexual assault. Um, those are probably our highest. Um, the first dream that was going to meet those needs was the Camas Institute. It would provide, you know, the health and wellness services and any other services, basically, that would meet the tribal needs for the elders, the children, and all that. At the Camas Institute, the essence of the person is defined in, in four ways which make up the spirit, which is the emotional, the psychological, the physical, and the spiritual and this embodies the whole person. We just praise you uh, as we pray for the four directions, Father. We just thank you for each and all things, Father, that is uh, of living creation. In 
your beautiful name, Aho. We call it Madlie Sial, which means medicine wheel in our language. And so we address um, recovery issues in that way, uh, whether it's with victims of domestic violence, victims of crime, um, alcohol and drug abuse. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, we address all the issues. I can recall in my early practice that um, it was a no-no to talk about spirituality with our clients. And we do need to address it. Um, and it needs to be what the person wants it to be. Victims of crime um, have been damaged in the way that they look at themselves. And it's very, very hard for them to see anything good in their lives. We want to show them all their strengths and get them to start believing in themselves again. And we do it through our tribal traditions, our sweat house, our winter dances, our morning smudging process with the sweet grass. When we light it and the smoke comes up, all that time we're making our prayers and cleansing, letting it go with the wind, making it go with the smoke as it reaches up. Native American tribes approach spirituality in different ways. Each tribe has its own sense of spiritual practice. Spiritual practices vary depending on region, location, uh, time of the year. Sometimes if, if we find somebody faltering, I, I try to step back and bring them up with me and so that we all walk together. If there's something I can't handle, I, I say, well, go see Good Joe Wainer's group or refer them to Ricky or somebody. We have a talking circle uh, for men and women. Then we have what we call our light bison uh, uh, recovery support groups. We have men's, women's, um, children's, family. I'm a survivor of domestic violence. So that means my children learned it. So they need to talk about it. I think my age group is saying, no, we need to talk about these domestic violence secrets and heal from them. Even though I was a professional woman, educated Indian woman at that time, that domestic violence, if it hadn't been for our tribal traditions, I could never have broken it. 10 years from now, I see our tribe a little stronger than we are today because we are beginning to become aware of our, the importance of our traditions, the importance of our culture. We also share our gifts with non-Native Americans because it works for anyone who, who believes. So we're trying to make the community the treatment center. It's like a center without walls. The idea of uh, drawing together the Daughters of Abraham came with 9-11. Um, I was very compelled to do something, but could not figure out what that something was. Until that happened, I, I didn't realize that people really don't know anything about us. And all of a sudden, they're looking at us like we are the enemy. For a while, my housekeeper, she wouldn't let me leave the house because I wear a scarf. And she was nervous. She thought somebody would attack me. I thought if we could bring together Jewish, Christian, and Muslim women, we could interact and teach each other. The uh, Daughters of Abraham derive the name from the biblical patriarch Abraham. All three of our religions trace our roots to Abraham and look at him as a spiritual father. The Daughters of Abraham meet once a month and uh, each meeting is rotated uh, from church to synagogue to mosque. When we meet in a mosque, we respect their holy space by covering ourselves with a scarf or a hat. At each meeting, there is a discussion topic, and it's announced the meeting before. Some things flow from our meetings. Uh, some of us have backgrounds in nonviolence. 
I was a rape crisis counselor for five years here in Fort Worth, and I brought that experience with me. Family violence isn't supposed to happen, but it does happen. And it does happen in families where they're supposed to be religious, and it happens behind closed doors. In any faith community, there are women who are known throughout the faith community through their volunteer work, for example, with rape crisis centers and battered women's shelters and child abuse programs and so forth. I'm happy we have this group, and maybe we need to educate more people that we have a support group that we are willing to help with, work with them. People in my area know me, and they trust me. So if I have had people come to me and talk about being abused, women, and I have guided them where to go, because not being in that work myself, I cannot solve their problem, but I can help. We, we have to know how to help them. Right. You know, sometimes we can help them by just listening to them and then advising them where to go for help. We developed a public awareness campaign uh, that was funded by OVC, working with the newspaper here and other media outlets. We developed a poster that we distributed that listed the victim assistance organizations throughout Tarrant County as a place where women of any faith could go and get help. The value of linking the faith community with the victim assistance community, with the psychiatric community, with the medical community, is that uh, all are needed to serve the individual. I want every community to have a Daughters of Abraham group where they can reach out to each other and uh, get to know each other, to get to understand their faiths and be ready to help each other. Brittany, I just need to do a neurologic exam. I have been uh, part of the faculty at the Medical University of South Carolina for now 12 years. But it's real easy. You'll do fine. I was fortunate to be involved with Church of the Holy Cross. So that made me also think about what are churches doing? What are synagogues doing? What are faith communities doing to help victims of child abuse and neglect? So um, at our child abuse conference, we had a speaker there, and she told me about a program that she had heard of in another community where they had really paired up caseworkers with congregations. And I started thinking, we live in the city of churches. We can do that here. Eve sent a letter to many of the churches asking us to come to a meeting to form this organization to assist citizens in our community. And she was hoping to get a conglomerate of different faiths and bringing them together uh, to work within the community. Eve is a religious person and um, attends church regularly. And um, I'm Jewish, and um, I also t attend synagogue regularly. And it sort of just felt like the right place, um, you know, to start um, reaching out um, to, to people. As a caseworker in, in the 70s, um, we were always taught separation of church and state. And now, with HALAs especially, we're bringing the faith community right into our casework, um, which, is, which is very, it's very different. Um, it's very different, but absolutely effective. When I was a caseworker with the Department of Social Services about 30 years ago, um, we had a list of providers in the community um, to call when we needed help for a client. I can remember calling up to 10 resources before I could get one to, to say, yes, I'll try to meet that need. So HALOS has reduced the number of calls to one call. Our caseworker today can make a call to their partner with HALOS and make a request and receive what they need for their family. Whether it's um, back to school, a back-to-school drive for supplies, book bags, uniforms, um, the angel tree at Christmas time, um, enrichment programs where there's a child who has a special gift that may need um, maybe piano lessons or they want to learn to dance. You know, I might 
um, run an article in our newsletter at Grace Church asking someone to um, help assist a child to go to summer camp. It helps a child's self-esteem and it also helps the family because the family then can concentrate on something else other than say, well, my child now has essentials for school. Now I can devote my time to seeing that other areas of the family are stabilized. I have a couple of really nice thank you notes. He goes, Dear Halos, I thank you for sending me to camp. I like it very much. I have a lot of fun. And he drew a picture of himself in the pool. I think that one of the real pleasures about watching Halos grow, and it started out really sort of as my baby, but it's an absolutely collectively owned baby now. Charleston County DSS is the envy of some of my peers in, in the state because they often ask, how do you get done what you get done? And um, some have expressed interest in having an organization such as Halos in their communities. It's, it's really a tremendous benefit, not only to the caseworkers, but to the families we serve. Okay. Thank you all. See you next month. The faith based community has long been dedicated to helping those who are exploited. I'm a victim of trafficking in. I wish this thing didn't happen to me. Human trafficking is any kind of recruitment, harboring, transporting, obtaining a person for the purposes of commercial sex or forced labor. As we all know, slavery has been outlawed for a very long time. But in fact, this is modern day slavery. I came here when I was 17 years old. And uh, I, I came here with a family from, from my country as a their babysitter. When I got to this country, things were, were nice, but after a few months, things change. People are tricked or forced or abducted or threatened into situations which against their will. And many times, victims of human trafficking um, come from countries where religion is extremely important to them. So it has not been uncommon for a church to be the only point of contact for the victim of trafficking. I couldn't go nowhere. I couldn't have, I couldn't have f f friends. I couldn't go to school. Trafficking victims often are, you know, observed and constrained. One uh, opportunity for them to leave their trafficking uh, location is that they are allowed, some are allowed to go to church. And so that may be the one small window of opportunity to engage with that victim and begin the identification and the rescue process. Before when I was there in Peru, she told me that, you know, they have, you have your friend there, and. So. You could go out and everything, you could go to school and all that. But, you know, after that, once I got to this country, it was totally different. He ended up working many, many hours per day, uh, per week, uh, under threat uh, of deportation or harm to his family, his mother and sisters in, in Peru. I think it was five in the morning, four in the morning. Immigration officers came downstairs and they went to another rooms. We unheard them. I just tried to run away. <laughs> so what can I do? I just, I tried to run away. But they caught me when I was outside. Once the investigation um, gave enough information to the ICE agents that they were possible victims of human trafficking, they were brought back and were placed in a hotel. However, the victims were not willing to come forward with a lot of information. They were absolutely terrified to speak. This is the most vulnerable time for a victim because they have just come out of a slavery situation. They need the most intensive services. A couple of people from my office, including me and Safe Horizons, we went to the hotel. Uh, once I identified that we were from the Catholic Church, um, that's when people started talking to us. They told me that they're going to help me 
all that I have to do is just tell the truth. And that's what I did. Yeah, they were really nice. They were really nice to me. Many faith-based organizations, and this is certainly true of ours, have the networks to do effective work. And so that makes us a natural in terms of doing the services. By working with refugees and providing resettlement services, we know whom to go to. We know that people need housing. We know that people need to eat and how to organize large groups to provide these kind of services. We have many partners in the community that add pieces to our program that we don't do. And I think it enriches our services because it's a difference in agency and personnel and maybe philosophy. Faith-based organizations are part of this, this broad network. That's why it's been encouraging to see non-governmental agencies and government agencies really come together in you know, a victim-concerned way, victim-centered approaches to work as a team to address all of those needs. A lot of crime victims don't get anybody to uh, talk with them, uh, to help them when they get in trouble. I mean, if to put police come, write it up, and most of the time, that's just it. Good Samaritan's program is a crime victim assistance program that brings uh, community volunteers uh, into service of crime victims, particularly uh, senior citizens, um, women living alone, disabled people people who have no resources to recover after a crime, especially with property crimes, because property crimes are the ones that are solved the least and they are the most uh, frequent crimes that are committed. We think then that our Good Samaritans project could alert community volunteers to this problem that night. And if necessary, come fix the door or the window that night. or come stay there till dawn or till another family member can come. The Good Samaritans program has been um, growing uh, for the past year uh, into some new communities. Pritchett um, is a city that has been stricken by poverty and crime. Our church is um, right in the center of a poverty-stricken area and uh, we do a lot of ministry work. The Good Samaritan program, the major attraction to me was that we get community, faith-based community to be a part of looking out for those that have been victimized. We uh, work with volunteers um, throughout the community, but we recruit the volunteers by going into churches. John Jones, Trent Lutheran, Minnie Dewberry, First Baptist of Pritchard. We train the volunteers by bringing them into a four-hour training session because they need to uh, be compassionate and understand what crime victims experience. How many of you have been a victim of crime? Just show of hand. A lot of our victims need someone just to listen, and it's important to be able to have the communication skills and the listening skills to help those who have been a victim of crime. Do you think schools should have sex education as part of their curriculum? We also have um, a lot of exercises that we use to see what your values are. Um, sometimes it's hard. We think we know what our values are, but when we do that little exercise, sometimes things change. And with this exercise, they're able to see that, you know, these are my values, but I can't force those things on others. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine, thank I'm you. How you doing? Kelly Sanders. Good to meet you, Miss Sanders. Nice Miss Sanders. You. So we do some some uh, victim service. Uh, specific training and then we also uh, do some training on how to fix a lock or uh, how to board up uh, a window. We train uh, Good Samaritan volunteers and everything to uh, do uh, deadbolts, install doors, windows, uh, fences, things of that nature. Whatever the job needs, you know, that's what we train them for. It takes all of us working together to utilize our resources to make sure that the victim is taken care of. If we leave, 
the peace of the community up to cops and prosecutors, we're going to lose. There's too much work to be done. And we have to have, among other things, faith-based institutions leading the way.